<laughs> wow. Greatest applause ever. <laughs> okay, so we'll try this one again. Who I am and what I'm going to be talking about. So my name, as was very kindly mentioned, is Ricardo Spagni or Ricardo Spagni, depending on which country I'm in and what people feel like saying. I live in South Africa in Plettenberg Bay. You don't need to remember that. There won't be a test. And you may know me, if you've seen me on Reddit or Twitter, you may know me as Fluffy Pony. And that's a discussion for another time. So today I'm going to be talking a little bit about why privacy matters. Uh, we're going to talk about 50 shades of privacy because obviously it is a concern and there's lots of solutions and not very good solutions as well. And then what Monero is and does, uh, the people behind Monero, how we're trying to make it useful and usable and the future of Monero. So 50, sh oh, sorry, why privacy matters. So this is the part where we don't talk about drugs. Because otherwise, you know, <laughs> there's a little more to privacy than that. Because the thing is, privacy is not just for criminals. Privacy is for everyone. It's actually important to everyone. For example, and this is just talking about transactional privacy, if you don't have private transactions, then you could have advertisements based on your spending habits. You could have crime that's targeted against the wealthy and they know how much money you have and when you have it as opposed to indirectly being able to view what you have. There could be unintended, unintended leakage of sordid purchases so the people at work know that you went around the corner and built a, bought a dildo and that's terrible. Or you could have unwitting complicis, complicity in criminal acts which of course is a big one in uh, Bitcoin. You could receive coins that come from the evolution exit scam or from some exchange heist and now suddenly you are the proud owner of some tainted Bitcoin. And that's suddenly terrible because what if the exchange that you want to deposit those coins to says, sorry, we no longer accept those coins no matter how far down the line it is. Yeah, sorry for taking them, you know. Uh, and then, of course, there's minor um, censorship based on recipient. We've already seen this um, with Bitcoin that some nodes censor um, transactions that are to or from Satoshi Dice. And that's also, you know, <laughs> really, quite frankly, if, if somebody wants to gamble on Satoshi Dice, I don't think miners have the right to censor it, but hey. <laughs> and it could reveal sensitive business relationships. So um, it's, it's all fine and well being able to know who the suppliers and the supply chain are. But, you know, when your competitor can see that, that's not great. And for the same reason, it's not ideal to leak salaries, profit margins, and revenue. So... <laughs> When the topic of privacy comes up, then one of my pet peeves comes up as well, which is the unbanked. And this happens a lot at Bitcoin conferences. People go, oh, we're bringing Bitcoin to Africa. And I go, no, you're not. Because the reality is that people in Africa, the unbanked in Africa, which makes up 80% of the sub-Saharan population, 326 million unbanked adults, they actually want to be unbanked. They don't want to go and shove their money in a bank, even though the, the ability is there, because they don't want the tax man to know. And they don't want, sometimes if you're a taxi driver and you're part of, uh, you know, you, you're part of a fleet that's owned by one guy, you don't want your boss to know, like, how much money you're taking in, because you're skimming off the top. Now, you go to the taxi driver and say, let me tell you about Bitcoin. <laughs> He's not going to care because, A, it's difficult, but even if you get past that, he doesn't want people to know what he's taking in and what he's spending. And and the cash is amazing. And cash in, in the context of Africa is great because it's extremely fast. It's mostly for free. It basically has no fees. The issue that no one has solved until more recently is that cash lets you operate privately. Now, obviously, we heard a little bit earlier about um, a very famous person, um, Charm, and we're going to get to him in a moment. Because uh, he created one of the first private electronic cash um, systems. But the issue that you have is that people don't care yet. Because as long as they can play Farmville, they're happy to give up their, their privacy. And so this was a very interesting study called Public Perceptions of Privacy and Security in the Post-Snowden Era. It was conducted by Pew Research Center. And they went around and they interviewed thousands of American adults. And they said to them, of this list of things, tell us which of them is very private to you? And, you know, you start off at the top. Okay, Americans, they, they've got their social security number. That's critical because if they reveal that, they're screwed and people can take their social security number and open accounts and get loans and stuff. Content of your emails, yeah, okay, 55, 52%. Uh, you know, somebody reads my emails. Is it that bad? Or you get down to like religious views, 22%, you know, 
bit of apathy there. Down to basic purchasing habits, 8%. The rest, 92% are like, well, can I play farm ball? Sure, have my basic purchasing habits. But the reality for us is that perceptions are changing. And this is especially true amongst Bitcoiners. So going back to Charm, this is a great quote on Reddit that spoke about how electronic cash is easy. Facebook can do it. And private electronic cash is also not too difficult because that was done in the 90s in this very building. But decentralized electronic cash is is tricky. But, you know, Bitcoin sorted that. The next step is decentralized private electronic cash. And that is the hardest of all. Now, the thing is, we know what we want. We want private electronic cash. But there are lots of solutions. And there are lots of people purporting to have solutions to this. And so the thing is, there have been a bunch of attempts at Bitcoin privacy, and some, to a greater or lesser degree, have been mildly successful or unsuccessful. So the most common one is mixing, and mixing is kind of crummy because effectively what you're doing is you're saying, hello, centralized service, please take my money and promise that you'll give me some money back. That is the same, but not the same. And relying on that as a solution, well, you know, people have been burnt and they'll continue to be burnt. CoinJoin um, is a, a really, really great idea by Greg Maxwell. The downside to CoinJoin is there have been really bad implementations. So ShadeCoin, for example, was uh, blockchain.info's implementation, plagued with problems, um, you know, completely like the, the privacy that it said it had, it didn't have. Um, CoinJoin Sudoku proved that wrong. Then you've got Dark Wallet also, you know, and like finally, maybe possibly a really good coin join implementation, but Dark Wallet just not getting traction from a development perspective and just sort of like sitting and, and, you know, the, the lead developer disappears and then comes back and then Amir Taki is not available for ages because he's somewhere or, or somewhere doing something. And so there's no traction. There's no development. And, you know, we're supposed to rely on this for our privacy. It's concerning. And then you've got something more recent, Join Market, which I really like. Join Market's basically like the Tinder of coin join transactions, because what it does is it hooks you up with somebody else that also wants to do a coin join transaction, and it's all decentralized. There's no centralized um, uh, server, and that's kind of handy. But the problem with it is that it's still limited, because all of these try to solve the privacy problem, but they don't solve the fungibility issue. And that goes back to what the previous speaker was saying about defining money and how Bitcoin is not anonymous enough. And none of these solutions change that because that doesn't magically make Bitcoin fungible. Okay. Then, of course, there have been scam coins, sorry, altcoins and alternatives. And the reason that most of them have been scams is because developing decentralized security software is a lot harder than most people imagine. So you've got a non-coin, which is not a scam. I I quite like the non-coin guys, but that was the first and it was the one that was going to bring anonymity to crypto or to, to, sorry, to cryptocurrency transactions. And, uh, and also, I mean, they've just haven't had, haven't really gotten off the ground. They did some cool stuff. They, they did the first ITP integration for a cryptocurrency. But then beyond that, they've stumbled and they've sort of said, well, we're going to do zero cash, but then we're not going to do zero cash and no one really knows what's happening. Then you've got um, Darkcoin, Dashcoin, I don't even know what they're called today. And uh, apart from being plagued with very many problems like um, a pre-mine and a very, very broken proof-of-work algorithm that just slaps all SHA-3 candidates in a row and says, yes, we made a new, uh, a new algorithm, um, they've got these thing called, things called masternodes. And now you're supposed to trust your privacy to a bunch of people running masternodes kind of concerning. It doesn't matter how many masternodes there are or how many masternodes there appear to be. The fact of the matter is there is one guy who owns 20% of the masternodes. And like that means that, statistically speaking, even if we're only talking probabilities, your transaction, which is meant to be private, could pass through masternodes under his control. And that's not acceptable. Then you've got crypto note coins, and Monero is, uh, was originally a crypto note coin. The problem with alternative or, or other crypto note coins is they're not keeping up to date with the things that Monero is doing. They're not reading the research papers we're putting out and making adjustments accordingly. And that means they're also going to be stuck in the past with privacy that was good but is not going to be good enough later on. And then, of course, if you visit Bitcoin Talk and 
read any of the posts, there's always a new coin being pushed that it claims to solve everything in the world, but meanwhile, turns out to be a scam. And you'll find that a lot of them, Navajo coin and whatever, when you actually go and look at what they're doing, they're just hitting a centralized mixer under their control. So it's not even, it's, it, it really is just privacy theater. There's no real privacy there. Now, you get to the cream of the crop. And really, when we're talking about cryptocurrency, um, uh, not cryptocurrency in general, but when we're talking about you know, cryptocurrency that is Bitcoin-like, and, and when we're talking about transactional privacy, there are really only three currencies that we, that we care to talk about. There's Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is, uh, is, is fantastic, and I already like Bitcoin. Downside, all transaction data is visible. Ah. Upside, um, it's old, tested, reviewed cryptography. Yay. Okay. Downside, your privacy relies on the upsick of others. Ah. Upside, well, there's not another upside that I could put on there. So another downside is that privacy-related features later on or even now, there's massive, massive political hurdles on, on Bitcoin side to adding them. If somebody had to go along and submit a pull request today that added tons of transactional privacy to Bitcoin, it would face very strong pushback from a lot of people just because of the, the current standing and nature of Bitcoin. Then you've got Monero, and we'll get into the details about what Monero does and how it works. But your transaction data is not publicly visible. It's only visible by choice by you handing out your view key. Your privacy, therefore, relies on your OPSEC. The cryptography is old. We're talking about crypto that was developed in the 80s and 90s with some more recent stuff, you know, 2002, 2007, but nothing completely whiz-bang. So... That's great, but then the implementation still needs some testing. You know, I mean, the more eyes, the better. I mean, Bitcoin's been hammered for many years, and Monero's only been around for a year and a bit. Uh, but the other advantage is that we can continue to enhance privacy without facing much in the way of political challenges, because, hey, if we're already private, adding privacy doesn't really make a difference. And then you've got zero coin, zero cash, which is coming soon, we promise. So they tell us. And again, I really like zero coin, zero cash. I do think in the future, it's possible in, in 15, 20 years time that that's what we'll be using. We'll be using some, well, not that specifically, but some derivative of it. And, and it, it's great because it's basically like this big black hole that transactions go into. And no one can tell what's happening. The downside is that the cryptography is so whiz-bang and so new that it's completely untested. And that coupled with the big transactional black hole means that a Coinbase transaction or the equivalent of a Coinbase transaction, if there was a bug in the implementation, could spew out billions of, of uh, zero coin and no one would be able to tell. So that's an issue. Um, but of course, you know, they have the same advantage that they can continue to enhance privacy. So who knows? You know, the future is pretty open from that perspective and I hold out high hopes for them. But I do think that it needs a good 10 to 20 years worth of, of testing and vetting before it's reasonably safe. Okay, so what Monero is and does, and no, it's not a traditional Spanish breakfast sausage, which somebody actually asked me. They said, yes, I've heard of Monero. <laughs> I'm sure I had one for breakfast. And I said, no. So Monero seeks to be truly electronic private cash. So like we said, it's decentralized, it's electronic, and it's private. Now, typically speaking, when we talk about digital currency, normally you only get two of these. Well, sometimes you only get one. But, you know, for the most part, like Charm created cash that was electronic and private, but it wasn't decentralized. And Bitcoin is decentralized and electronic, but not very private. So Monero is trying to do like all three. Okay, so a very brief primer on Monero's cryptography, because Monero is special in that transactions are unlinkable and untraceable. Now, when we use the terms unlinkable and untraceable, it means that that's within a certain cryptographically negligible measure of risk. The terms unlinkable and untraceable refer to cryptographic properties and are in no way endorsed by Wikipedia, the Guinness Book of World Records, or in Carter CD-ROM 1995 Special Edition. By using the software, you agree to indemnify Alice, Bob, and all their agents and not rifle through their sock drawer at night. And we say that because otherwise people go like, oh, it's unlinkable and untraceable. Great, I can just do whatever I want and everything's fantastic. And then you've got people on the other side of the pond that are going, oh, it's not really unlinkable and untraceable because if you can crack a 256-bit hash, then you break it. And I'm like, well, if you can crack a 256-bit hash, there's a lot more you can do. So how Monero works, let's talk about unlinkability first. Now, 
when we say cryptographically unlinkable, what we mean is that for outgoing transactions, if you take two outgoing transactions, it's impossible to prove that they were sent to the same person. Now, with Bitcoin, the way Bitcoin works, and this, we should at least be vaguely familiar with this considering we're at a Bitcoin conference, you've got your private key, from that you generate your public key, then you create a hash, and pretty much with all transactions that are paid to that hash, that are, are destined for that uh, hash, you can view the outputs on the blockchain. Okay. Now, with Monero, it works slightly differently. What happens is you've got two keys, a spend key and a view key, and you don't publish a hash, you publish the actual public keys, you give them out to people. And then there's this little computation, this magical computation that takes each power of 10 outputs, and we'll get into the power of 10 stuff in a moment, and it's got this little formula which is basically just a hash function, and we take A and B, which are your, pu your um, public and, uh, I mean, sorry, your view and spend keys, and G is a, a cryptographic base point, and then R is this random that you choose. And so because you choose this random, it means that for each output, they appear to be different, even though the outputs are going to the same person. So, practically, <laughs> this is how it works. Let's say we want to send money. Now, here's our cryptographic transaction, and there's a thousand Monero that we're using as an input. So what we do is we go, okay, this is going to the recipient, and we break these up into powers of 10. We're sending 123 Monero, okay? Off they go to the recipient, and as you can see, the destination appears to be different. And that's what's recorded in the blockchain. Now, obviously, it's longer in real life, but, you know, for the purposes of this. So if you look at it, you go, well, okay, I can see they're going to the recipient because they're one after the other and yada, yada. But now, here's our change that's coming back in. And the change also looks like it's going to random recipients or to random destinations, even though the change is coming back to us. And when you look at it like this, it's really easy because you can go, yeah, that's the recipient and that's the change. But once you do that or that, it becomes a little bit more complex. Because when you look at that transaction, you can't see the amount that was sent. You can't see if there was more than one recipient. You can't see if there was any change. All you can see is a bunch of outputs that appear to go to a random destination. What are you asking? Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's untraceability. Now, the advantage that the view key gives us is it actually creates this really nice um, regulatory compliance system. But the advantage is that it's not regulatory compliance like with Bitcoin where it's like, oh, hey, everything's exposed. It's regulatory compliance in that you are the one who chooses to expose your view key. You're not compelled to, at least not by, not by any technical system, but the government can come knock on your door and say, buddy, give me your view key. And you can choose to hand over your view key, which reveals all your transactions, or you can go stuff you, or you can give them one of your view keys and keep the other ones under your mattress. And so in that way... It's, it's great because it means that your privacy is controlled by you. And also for um, an audit, from an auditing perspective, you can hand your view key over to an auditor and that auditor can audit you year after year, but they can't spend your funds. All they can do is view what you've done and you don't need to give them a list of anything. You just give them the view key. Same for charities. Charities can go, well, we need public oversight or maybe later on in future governments could do this. They could say, we need public oversight. So boom, here are our view keys. Go look at our transactions. Go see what we're doing. And that's obviously like highly advantageous because it means that from a regulatory perspective, we've got privacy, but then also the ability to, to be compliant with regulation on demand, which means privacy is default and revealing your stuff is optional. Okay, so untraceability. Now, with untraceability, what that means is that for incoming transactions, there appear to be multiple senders, and the chance of the of you picking the correct sender out of that, well, they're equiprobable, so your chance is one in n, however many senders there are. So again, typically with Bitcoin, we have an input which is a comes from a previously unspent transaction output. We put it into a into a transaction. We sign it using a, the a SEC P256K1 curve um, and a, a DSA signature, and then we can we can look on the blockchain and we can link inputs back to the previously unspent output. Now with Monero, it's a little bit different because basically there appear to be multiple possible senders that go into the single input, and then we sign it with something called a ring signature, which uses Schnorr signatures. On an, and an ED25519 curve. And so what that means effectively is that we can't link transactions back to their previous sender. So 
Just to go back to our, our practical example, yeah, we have the 1000 Monero input. Now we're going to figure out how we actually got there. So what, we do, what we've done is we've gone and we've taken all the 1000 Monero outputs on the blockchain. The one in red is our one. That's the one we actually hold the private key to. We don't hold the private keys to the rest of them. They're on the blockchain. We can only see, you know, the, the public outcome, the public keys for the output. And then what we do is we pick a bunch of them. In this case, we've picked six. And we create this really awesome ring signature. Now, in this part of the process, we can see that that one's the real one. But obviously, later on, once it ends up in the actual transaction, we can't see which one of those is the real one. But in order to avoid being able to spend that output more than once, we have this thing called a key image, which is kind of like a hash of the private key. It's a little bit more complicated than that, and there's lots of cryptography magic. But for the purposes of this discussion, it's like a, a hash of the private key, which means if we had to go and try to spend it again, we would end up with a duplicate key image, regardless of the set that we choose to mix with. And that would obviously then be rejected by nodes because they go, yo, buddy, this key image has already been sent, spent. And so effectively what we end up with is that. And that's a typical Monero transaction. So, so there's your input. It's got this ring signature that was created. And, and by the way, that ring signature could have been created offline. You didn't need to be online. You didn't need to find peers to mix with. You just checked the blockchain and found a bunch of outputs. And you went, okay, cool, I can mix with these. And this kind of answers the, the question of why we have these powers of 10 for each output. The reason is because if you were sending 123.9783 Monero to somebody, chances are you're not going to find someone else to mix with that's used the same amount previously in the blockchain. But if you're sending it broken down by powers of 10, suddenly you've got a mixable set that's much larger. So, the thing with Monero is, yeah, okay, so the privacy thing is kind of our claim to fame, but it does other stuff too. So, for example, Monero is slightly inflationary. In May of 2022, we're going to end up hitting a minimum block reward of 0.3 Monero, and it will stay that way forever, which means Monero is, well, technically the term is slightly disinflationary because there's less than 1% inflation, but that decreases year on year. And the reason that we've done this is to retain mining incentives because we don't want to have a situation where the transaction fees are all that you're reliant on, are all that miners are reliant on. Then we have no block limit. Uh, we have a dynamic block limit. And what that does is that does a look back over the past um, sort of days blocks and it gets a median block size from that. And it says, okay, this is the median block size. The next block can only be like 20% larger. And so over time, obviously, if you create a block that's then 20% larger, larger, then the median goes up slightly. And over time, the block size limit increases just by virtue of use. And if somebody had to come along and go, well, we're going to like ramp up the block size by artificially creating thousands and thousands of transactions, that's fine. Because the minute they run out of uh, transaction fees and they stop, the block size limit goes back down. So they're not actually doing anything except being irritating. Then we have a disconnected architecture, which is kind of nice because it means that you've only got one daemon sitting on your computer talking to the network and you can run hundreds of wallets on your, um, on your computer and, or even on your network. And they only have to talk to this one single thing that speaks to the, the broader peer to peer network, which is kind of handy from a, um, you know, for, from an integration perspective or even from a, a user perspective because it means within a home or within an office, you only need to run one node. And we have different cryptography. So if you're interested in hedging against uh, Bitcoin's crypto, which I don't really think it's a hedge, but anyway, uh, we use ED25519 and Curve25519, um, which is basically EDDSA. So we use something created by Daniel J. Bernstein. And Bitcoin uses SecP, SecP256K1 and uh, ECDSA. Um, neither is really superior, but if you're into you know hedging one system against the other, then that's that. And we have an accessible proof of work algorithm. And what we mean by that is that it lowers the performance gap between CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs. So we're not ASIC proof. There's no such thing. But what we are is, um, in, in a way, like we're a little bit difficult for ASICs. We're a bit of a problem. And we do this by leveraging the AES and I extensions in CPUs, amongst other things, being memory hard and so on. And the advantage there is basically what it means is, um, in whatever, 10 years time, when there are ASICs, then CPU miners will still be okay. They won't make a profit, but they will still be able to mine, whereas if you had to try and mine Bitcoin today with a CPU, well, 
you know, that's a bit of a joke. So that's, um, that's kind of advantageous and that it allows us to create some cool stuff. Now, obviously there are, um, some people behind Monero besides me. And it's, uh, it's kind of interesting how Monero got started. So what happened was there was this dude on Bitcoin Talk, thankful for today, and he launched Monero on April 18th, 2014. And there were a bunch of us that were really excited and we were like, oh, this is cool. What is this? And it was, it didn't use Bitcoin's um, code. It was completely different. Um, it was a fair launch of the crypto note reference code. And then thankful for today ended up being kind of a dick because he didn't listen to the community. And then eventually, like after, like the community even voted against stuff, he was like, no, I'm going to do this and there's nothing you can do to stop me. And so we did stop him by forking, um, forking the repo and saying, Hey, everyone, <laughs> we're not going to implement that. And so we kind of took it over, which is really interesting because it, the seven members of the core team weren't sitting around going, Hey, we should start an altcoin. In fact, we didn't even know each other until we ended up with this like orphan baby on the door that we had to raise. And, um, and so basically our role is stewardship and, We've, uh, we're very cognizant of the fact that we're just stewards and if we took it from someone, <laughs> someone else can take it from us. So we don't have a position of power or control. We're just there. And uh, there, like I said, there are seven of us. And of the seven, two of us are public in terms of having our real name out there. And uh, the other five practice OPSEC to a various uh, or to a greater or lesser degree, but um, many of them are quite well known um, especially within the cryptocurrency community. Um, and there are, of course, many, many, many other contributors. Um, we have 25 contributors to active contributors to Monero Core. Um, we've got the Monero Research Lab, which are a bunch of academics and they use pseudonyms. Um, and then we've got community contributors that, um, do everything from uh, maintaining lists and documentation and all sorts of jazz and adding stuff to the website. And then we've got really cool related software projects um, that people work on, um, GUI wallets and uh, mining pool because there was no compatible mining pool software. Um, and then all sorts of other things, a tipping bot and libraries, um, PHP and Node.js and ASP.NET libraries and all sorts of stuff and Python libraries as well. Okay, and obviously we've got costs that we need to cover. So the way we cover our costs, because we aren't driving around in Ferraris, that happens next year. Um, the way we cover our costs is four ways. We've got general donations, and that's just when people go, hey, you know, have some Bitcoin in the, or Monero or PayPal or whatever, and they send it to us. And then we have service donations. So mining pools, for example, and some services contribute um, a portion of their, uh, their profit to us. And then we have sponsors, so Kitware, Dome9, Araxis, JetBrains, a bunch of others. They've contributed licenses and services and hosting and whatnot to us. Um, and then we have this new, new thing called the forum funding system, where on the Monero forum, um, uh, an ad idea can be pitched and discussed, and then it can be, it can move from just an idea to actually being picked up by somebody, whether it's a, a feature or a peripheral service or send Fluffy Pony to Europe to go and talk at conferences, whatever it is. And then that can be funded. There's a, a little bar that appears and it says, well, you know, here's the amount of funding we need and this is how much we've raised. And then people can sponsor specific ventures or specific ideas. And then it moves from that into the work in progress section and then there's milestones that can be set and then payouts are sort of per milestone. And that's kind of nice because it means that our role then goes from, hmm, what should we spend the very meager donations on to, oh, look, people can just contribute to that and we're just escrowing it. Okay. And what we're trying to do is make Monero useful and usable because at some stage we would actually like it to be grandparent friendly. So what we did more recently is we created this thing called OpenAlias and you can read more on openalias.org, but basically it's just an open aliasing system that leverages the existing infrastructure. At its most basic, it's a TXT record, a DNS record. And what that means is that um, we, we allow uh, for familiar paradigms, like paying an email address. So if you're not really sending anything to an email address, all you're doing is you're, you're changing the at into a dot and doing a, a TXT record lookup. And obviously, we need to make sure that there's some security there. So we use D DNSSEC, and uh, DNSSEC is a chain of certificates from the root uh, outwards. 
And if you don't want to use um, ICANN's infrastructure, no problem. You can use Namecoin. And if you're worried about the privacy of your lookups, well, we have something called DNS Crypt, which uh, is something that OpenDNS created and we leverage. And DNS Crypt basically just encrypts all of your DNS lookups. The advantage being that your ISP doesn't know what you're looking up. So you can make payments to rick at xmr.at or donate.getmonero.org and no one knows. And this is currently implemented in Electrum, Electrum 2.0, because it's not just for Monero. It's for Bitcoin and any other cryptocurrency. In fact, any protocol that needs it could implement it. So Electrum uses it from Electrum 2.0 onwards. And then um, uh, there's a, a web wallet, coin.space, that also use it. And then obviously Monero itself uses it. And uh, we've also been trying to, I mean, uh, the one thing that, that, uh, that Monero struggles a bit with is um, at the moment it is command line only. We do have a bunch of third-party um, GUIs, but obviously usability is a bit of an issue for people because apparently command line tools are really hard to use. Who knew? So, <laughs> so we have mymonero.com and that's a web wallet. It's currently the only web wallet because a Monero web wallet is kind of a, a tricky thing to do. Um, but that sort of handles the, the accessibility gap, at least in the short term. And then also on getmonero.org, which is our website, we've tried to, and, and there's a ton of content that still needs to be done by the community, but we've tried to make it, um, easy for newcomers to read and, and accessible and like, you know, explain things in, in reasonably simple terms. Um, because technical people are going to go straight to like Bitcoin talk in the forum. And so really the website's just for like noobs that go, oh my God, I don't even know what this is. Please explain it to me. And we are, of course, working on a GUI, but we're working on it slowly because, well, I mean, you know, we don't get paid. And so we, we can only work as and when we can. But we started with wireframes and then we did a bunch of designs for components. And that's kind of what we ended up with. And the code's up, but it's not, uh, the code's up and it's, and it's working. It's just not wired up and there's some screens that still need to be done. But it is kind of pretty and, uh, and we think it'll be nice and useful and usable. So, of course, the future of Monero, lastly, because Monero Core 1.0 will be able to bake your cake and eat it for you, I promise. So, what we're doing next is, um, is very interesting, and there's a lot of information on the slide, and, you know, sort of go read it in your own time, and we've got our design and development goals up on the website, and they make for interesting reading, too. But we're doing a lot of stuff with uh, Coinbase, uh, daughter chains, and uh, we're doing a lot of work with um, libraryizing uh, all of the all of the functions, all of the core functions. So instead of relying on you know hooking up via um, a zero MQ or RPC to to actually make calls, developers will be able to just drop the core Monero library into the application and use it. Uh, oh, and we're working on ARM support, which is more painful than anything I've ever done in my entire life. But soon you'll be able to do Raspberry Pi Monero. And that is pretty much it. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Lots of questions, please. <laughs> I know the name of the study. No, uh, Monero transactions, do they have a scripting language embedded like Bitcoin does? Is it, can you do smart contracts with them? Yeah, we've got, it's a very lightweight scripting language. So, so there's, um, there's some scope for that, but probably for, for smart contracts, because of the, the limitations of the lightweight scripting language, we'll do that in a daughter chain rather than trying to do it on main chain. Um, but yeah, there is a scripting language. So, so you can do multi-sig, for example, Although there's nothing that supports it, and there's some limitations to uh, multi-sig that uh, and uh, ring signatures that we're busy resolving. Ah, so, okay, so yeah, the crypto choices also bite a little bit with that yeah. in general. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is Monero uh, compatible with uh, new uh, developments like the Lightning Network? So we've we've looked at the Lightning Network, and there's some stuff that uh, that we find very interesting about the Lightning Network, but we are so far away from even looking at. <laughs> at implementing something like that um, that it's not even worth taking a serious look at because we'd just be wasting our time. 
Um, what we are doing, because we also do realize, um, recognize the need for faster transactions and that sort of thing, we've got an experimental daughter chain, which is still very, I mean, there's, the, there's like very, very little code that's been written. But the idea is that it will um, exist in parallel and settle back to the main chain on a daily basis. And that is extremely fast, extremely light, and can be discarded uh, you know, all the previous transactions can be discarded every day. So, so that's what we're looking at and playing around with because the, uh, the advantage of daughter chains is that not every single node needs to support them. So you can actually end up with like, like really high performance servers all over the world that are supporting this particular chain. And, uh, and it's still backed by the main chain and it still pegs to the main chain. So anyway, there's, there's stuff like that that might, when we get down to it, it might not uh, necessitate a need for something like the Lightning Network um, or a, hub, a traditional sort of hub and spoke system, but we'll see. Similarly, they do colored coins, uh, assets, uh, the kind yeah. of stuff that people are trying to bolt onto Bitcoin. So, so we've got a we've got a nice little TX extra field um, in Monero, which is bigger than op return, and the, you know you can shove metadata into TX extra. So there's nothing stopping anyone from doing a colored coins like implementation. Uh, the downside, of course, would be that it would be visible because TX Extra is not, uh, it's not encrypted or, or hashed with a random or anything. So it's also like with that, we've got Monero assets that we're playing around with and that, but I mean, we're talking about stuff that'll come in like three, four years, you know, <laughs> if we're lucky. And, and that will, will have asset classes as separate chains and you'll be able to do, um, federated pegging back to the main chain or you'll be able to do, um, swaps between chains and that sort of thing. So we are trying to solve the, the asset issue, but, Maybe not necessarily by shoveling stuff into the main chain unnecessarily. Uh, finally, uh, can you uh, spend some words uh, explain uh, how safe the mining, uh, uh, how much safety is provided by the current sure. mining infrastructure? Is yeah. this coin already safe in that sense? Um, I, I don't believe any coin is safe except Bitcoin right now. <laughs> if you, I mean, to be honest, you know, the, the, there's a, a reasonable amount of hash rate and it wouldn't be cheap to attack. But for a motivated attacker with um, with a bit of money in the bank, they could attack the the mining network quite quite trivially, especially because all they'd need to do is go buy a bunch of like GPUs. You know, they don't even need specialized equipment. So so it's um if you're looking for like like super like insane amounts of of transactional safety on an ongoing basis, um probably not the the best place to be right now. At least not until you know it's matured and the, the mining network has grown. But if you're looking to as a safe store of value, you know, then it's different because, I mean, you, you put it into a cold wallet and then it's not exposed to issues with the mining network or whatever. Thank you. Cool. Yes. Thanks. Um, first of all, uh, have you considered pegging it to Bitcoin at some level, like on a daily, weekly basis? We've looked, uh, I mean, like, so there's two things. I mean, there's the, the Bitcoin, side, the, the side chain, the blockchain, not the value. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's the side chain approach. And, and I mean, we've spoke the side chain guys, um, the, the blockchain guys, and we speak all the time and whatever. And, and I like side chains, but I like side chains for Bitcoin. Um, the issue that I have with it is that it then means our success or failure is indelibly linked to Bitcoin and, uh, and well, our failure more than anything else. And what I'd like to see is a future where, regardless of what happens with Bitcoin, we're still around. And, and I fear that pegging, um, pegging ourselves to Bitcoin's mining network would put us at risk um, on more, in more ways than one. Mm. Let's call it backing it up on to Bitcoin to prevent a 51% attack on current mining. I mean, like, we, well, we could, uh, we could, at a, at a particular point, we could shove a, um, a block hash into, into Bitcoin's, uh, chain. The reality is, like, I, I don't think that any, I don't think we can build in an automated system to check that because, um, we then have to assume that people are running the, the, uh, Bitcoin daemon locally. And I don't know if anyone's going to manually check it because people are lazy. <laughs> But, but I do, I mean, it is a good idea and we've, we've done some other stuff, um, on the checkpoint, on the checkpointing side. Um, we use, uh, we basically put checkpoints, um, like informational checkpoints into TXT records on a bunch of domains. Um, and then those are secured with DNSSEC and, um, basically like it's just informational. So, you know, if you end up on a fork, then it's going to go, Oh, hey, you, you know, I haven't hit this, but you can also enable and enable, um, forcing 
compliance with those DNS checkpoints. So we have done some stuff like that to, to prevent um, rewinds and attacks and that sort of thing. Um, and we're actually at the moment busy fiddling around with um, a, a better difficulty algorithm because we retarget on a per block basis. But um, I think it's it, at the end of the day, it, it does require a stronger mining network, regardless of how we, you know, of, of what we do as a as a backup. Yeah. And a second question: um, Why is the division two powers of ten? It seems a bit arbitrary. Um, well, look the. <sighs> So, so they, we could cut that down to um, like two, three, and five, you know, whatever, because you can make up most numbers from that. Um, but and, and that would give us a larger mix set for some things. But at the end of the day, the, the powers of 10, for whatever reason, they're in at the moment. And, uh, and the, only way we, the only change that we'd want to make with that in the future is to go to a smaller um, set of denominations and therefore larger mix sets. But, but that being said... Even for like really obscure denominations like 30,000 Monero, um, there's a, a reasonable mixing set. So, cause you know, that it's like it never gets spent as long as it's being spent, you know, with others, then you never really know if it's spent. <laughs> cool. Anything else? Um, if everything is anonymous, then yes. am I able to check the total amount of the money supply going around? Yeah, because remember, you, you still see the Coinbase transaction. So, so you can't see who the Coinbase transaction is going to, but you can count them up on a block-by-block -block basis, which is obviously advantageous as well because it means that if there is an implementation failure, we can spot somebody creating. Exactly, that was my... Yeah, thanks for that. You mentioned uh, about four years or something, some of the development it could take. But it seems to me that that's one of the hardest things to predict how like you know how the network effect would take it over yeah so hypothetically if you suddenly got a huge surge in developer interest yeah do you think like the development would accelerate it could, could it scale that that way oh yeah the, the the development is um is one thing but then the research side is another um and the two go hand in hand like the 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 Monero research lab guys some of them do some development as well but for the most part they are academics and so they're focused more on the on the theory which is which is great yeah, big distinction yeah. Between you and other guys and absolutely research. yeah so so but we need the research you yeah, know no, because the research tends to identify problems that we don't think about because they run simulations and whatnot and then there's the actual implementation and and i suppose if there was a surge of developer interest that's great because then the development side would pick up and there's lots of cool stuff that we could do but but the research side would then lag you know but normally you get a bit of both you know so, so yeah, I mean, if there was sudden interest and, and uh, a lot of people and, and uptake, not only in usage, but in, in yeah, contribute, right. yeah, then we could definitely scale things from that perspective quite easily. Uh, what the, uh, the cheapest way to get Monero? Uh, is there a, what the mining uh, profitability, how is it going now? And, uh, and the second question: If I if I if I send if I send money uh, to buy Monero, uh, where do I send it? And yeah. uh, is that uh, that's uh, that's something that's traceable? Yeah. Okay. So so first question first. Um, the, the cheapest way to get Monero, I would imagine, would be mining. Um, the the mining network. Um, I mean, mining with GPUs at the moment is reasonably. I don't think it's massively profitable, but you'd break even at least. Um, and, and so I think that's probably like if you, if you happen to have like a bunch of GPUs lying around, <laughs> that's probably the, the easy, uh, the, the cheapest way, um, over a period of time. For a more immediate demand, well, there's a bunch of exchanges, you know, Poloniex has it, um, BitT, BitT Rex has it, and a couple of others you can check on the, on the site. There's a, no, Oopsie doesn't. It's, remember, it's not, uh, it's not forked from Bitcoin. So we don't have Bitcoin's RPC API. We don't have block notify. We don't have wallet notify. So exchanges go, oh, I'm sorry. You want me to do what? <laughs> and then they get very confused. And, and you can speak to someone who's actually integrated Monero from scratch into a service. And it, he had lots of angry words to say <laughs> over how difficult it was. It's, it's not easy because it's, um, because there is a lack of documentation and, you know, the libraries that are out now make it a lot easier, but it's still painful. So, so yeah, Poloniex, BitTrex, and a couple of others, uh, Melotic and, and some others. Um, 
the downside, of course, is like Poloniex has now just recently introduced um, some AMC, uh, sorry, a- AML KYC stuff. But for up to, I think it's two thousand dollars a day is the is the entry level limit, and all you need to give them, if I remember, is like your name and email address or your name and phone number or some jazz, so you can make something up. And what are they going to do? Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's unfortunately the the inevitable. Um, the inevitable thing that happens when dealing with exchanges. Um, but T-Rex, I think, will eventually go that way as well because they're based in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, I think in the, in the end, it depends on, on what your, um, what your risk threshold is like. You know, if you don't really care, uh, because once you've got it in Monero, then everything from there on out is irrelevant. Um, then, yeah, you know, just use an exchange. If you do care and you're worried about it, then mine. Oh, anything else? You had a question. <laughs> Please don't ask about documentation. <laughs> I was just curious about the sort of day-to-day life of running an altcoin. So, how many hours a week go into it? How do you juggle things? And yeah. So you know, I wake up in my mansion and like go to the. You know, so it's um, it is tricky. You know, like there, there's especially over the over the the first sort of year. I, one of the challenges was that we had people like hammering us with stuff all the time. Like our, our priority shifted every day because then, then this happened and that happened and this person needs this. Then, oh my God, how does Monero not have a GUI? Or, oh, I can't access it on my smartphone. Then we, we had an attack. There was somebody that figured out a, an exploit, um, that was not an exploit really, but just a way to fork the network because of some, um, poor C code that, uh, that just ended up Basically, like not being able to to produce the same hash for a very large block um, on each computer, and that was a problem because suddenly the network forked on the Saturday morning at like three o'clock in the morning or something, and uh, <laughs> that wasn't fun. It resolved itself in thirty five minutes, and then we had to patch it and all that. But still, it was it was messy. So it um, and that doesn't that hasn't really changed. I mean, it's it's calmed down now because we've had this. This initial flurry of uh, of people who expected the price to shoot up to like five billion dollars overnight, and they've fallen away because of lack of interest, and that's been really advantageous because it means that we no longer have constant pressure from um, people who actually have no idea what it's like to do development for free. Um, but there's a it, there are parts of it that are really interesting, and there are parts of it that are really annoying. But for the most part, the typical day is like just to have IRC open in the background because someone's going to ask something. Um, you know, check the forums, reply to stuff because, like, sometimes there's people saying idiotic stuff or asking questions that no one's answered yet. Um, and then, like, that, that's probably like three hours of my day every day. <laughs> Just like reading, catching up, um, stuff I missed overnight when I went to sleep. Like, if I could avoid sleeping, that would be great. And, uh, and then just, you know, like, like also mergers. That's, that's one of the things we're trying to fix at the moment is people submit pull requests and then no one tests it. I've got to go and like, okay, now I must test it. Windows, FreeBSD, OSX, 32-bit Windows, Linux, 32-bit. You know, I mean, like next minute it's taken me like four hours to test one pull request. So that gets frustrating as well. And and there's some stuff that we're trying to do um, to, to make that process easier. But it's there's a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of sort of chunky, like ongoing stuff. Um, and, and then at the same time, we're still trying to like do like continuous integration infrastructure so that we don't have to test everything manually but yeah it's <laughs> it's fun and incredibly infuriating at the same time thank you <laughs>